Are we on? We are. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the first session. Hey, Jenna. Hi. How are you? How you doing? Hey, Hi. Steve. Hello. All right. So welcome, everyone. This is our session on writing as activism with Steve Bowman <laughs> and Jenna Bloom. And uh, Jenna is wearing her shirt, I'm nasty and I vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, both Steve and Jenna are passionate, informed, and very, very outspoken uh, writers about, and, and they use their voices to try to promote justice and fairness and democracy in our culture. And uh, sometimes they get in trouble for that, but it's, it's the good kind of trouble, as John Lewis would say. Uh, Steve has been part of the conference since the very beginning. When I conceived of the conference, I made a wish list of people that I wanted to bring in, and Steve was at the very top of the list. And he's been coming pretty much every year since. He's the author of a dozen books, including Bad Stories, Rock and Roll Will Save Your Life, Not That You Asked, Candy Freak, uh, God Bless America. Most recently, he published William Stoner and the Battle for the Inner Life. And he also self-published one of my favorite writing guides called This Won't Take But a Minute, Honey, which I have, uh, I've assigned to my classes over the years and uh, people always love it. Uh, Jenna Blum is uh, a writer that I invited to the conference nine years ago and she finally accepted this year, <laughs> which is great. Uh, and and it's, it was the perfect year for her to accept because it's the same year as the pandemic. And as a result of the pandemic, she started uh, A Mighty Blaze, which has made it possible for us to even do this online this year. And for those of you who don't know, A Mighty Blaze is um, a literary marketing company for social media, basically, uh, and Jenna, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, because of the pandemic, a ton of writers had books coming out, and as a result of the pandemic, they 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 couldn't go on tour, they couldn't go out and promote it, and and Jenna felt that this was a tragedy, and so she and Carolyn Levitt decided to start a Marty Blaze to help people promote their books and and get some some people interested in what they were publishing, and um, and it's really taken off, and I'm thrilled that we're we're partnered with them this year. Um, but Jenna is not just the founder and CEO of A Mighty Blaze. She's also uh, an internationally best-selling author of three novels. Her first novel, uh, Those Who Save Us, was the number one book in Holland in 2011, the year that I invited Jenna to come to Sanibel for the first time. Uh, she also wrote The Storm Chasers and most recently, I might, The Lost Family. Um, and she's also, there it is. She's also been a, an instructor, a uh, very popular instructor at Grub Street Writers in Boston for over 20 years. So, guys, it please take it away. Years to get into What's that? Steve, you're a bit muffled. You're a little bit muffled for some reason. And frozen. And Tom is gone. What did we do? I don't know. Um, okay, guys. So, we froze Steve. And we lost Tom somewhere in the ether. So I'm just going to talk because that's what I do. I think Steve is rebooting and coming back, which is great. Um, but anyway, thank you all for being here this morning. We are delighted by the turnout for um, Sanibel Island Writers Conference online and more robust than ever because there are so many more people who are able to watch. I did not play my cards super well in terms of actually being on the island, but um, I at least am able to connect with all of you. And my dog is now squeaking his toy, which he does every time I get online. I have a puppy. So you're going to hear a lot of squeaking in the background. So sorry about that, you guys. So anyway, yay, Steve is back. Yay. I'm sorry. Um, Oh my God, no, this is how we live now, right? Everybody is so terrified of tech problems. And as somebody who runs a company with this amazing dream team of people um, that puts writers online all the time, I can tell you that like we wink out periodically, but we come back stronger than ever. So here we are. And uh, you guys, I'm sorry about my dog squeaking the toys. He is such a bleep, being a freaking like, ugh. he's very cute though. So, um, Steve, I just want to give a little preface about my shirt, like my nasty and vote shirt. 
I do a lot of my activism online and obviously like on my bosom out and about in the world. Uh, I was wearing this shirt the night of the 2016 election with a pantsuit. Like I had a Hillary pantsuit and I had tacos because Hillary was like, you know, the champion of the taco truck. And I remember watching that election on my couch in my pantsuit with my margarita and my tacos and my shirt and ending up that night, like so many of us crumpled in the corner of my couch, weeping hysterically because I could not believe what was going to happen to my country, like sort of catastrophically over the next four years. And so um, I was not silent, obviously, before the election, and I'm a lot louder after the election in writing online with my megaphone. I also have a backup megaphone just in case my first one shorts out. I am prepared. And um, I'm wondering, Steve, like what you have experienced in your own activism. I know that you teach classes to raise money. You're out there. Your book is actually like about, you guys should all order this book immediately if you don't already have it, is about the bad stories we've told ourselves in this country about who we are and what contributed to um, the place that we're in now. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about bad stories and then your experience of being a writer activist? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm going to say, I hope I don't tweak out, but if I do, Jenna is just going to pick me up. Uh, so if I tweak out, I'm, I'm sorry, it's internet. And also I love when the internet asks, you know, it says like your internet is unstable and I always feel like, or your connection, your connection is unstable. But something is wrong. And you're like, Oh really? I see that. Cause I'm like, yeah. Right. Yeah. It sort of see, feels like one of those moments where the computer is sending a deeper message to your psyche. Your connection is unstable. But you told a little story about you know where you were on election night in 2016. I was in Sanibel um, and at the conference, and you know going out and getting dessert and with, getting ready to celebrate with our oldest a child who's a, our daughter Josie who's a who was a, following the election very closely and was going to see we felt, felt and hoped her first female president in in US history and uh, there was a lot of excitement early on and and that started to fade as it became clear what was going to happen and my salient memory from that evening really affected the course of what I was going to spend my time doing it was maybe four in the morning in a Sanibel West Wind, you know, wood that we were there, West Wind in room, just looking at my kids sleeping and they're, you know, kids never more blessed than when they're sleeping and thinking two thoughts, you know, one after the other. First, uh, can I keep these kids safe in the big arc of things as a parent, given what this is saying about the trajectory of the American experiment, can I keep them safe? And then very quickly after that, my God, I'm a white guy with plenty of disposable income in a home, economically secure, professionally secure. What must it be for the parents of undocumented people, people of color, other marginalized group, people living in poverty or at the edge of poverty? What are they looking at their kids and thinking? How much is their, um, you know, what's happening to their T-shirts um, if they're aware of... Um, kind of the, the dark turn. And I think at that point, I also said, I am probably not going to be right in my head until I try to try to explain to myself even, but in a way that my kids might be able to understand the decision that the adult world, whether through their insufficient activism, their negligence, or the bad stories they're telling, whatever combination, the adult world made this decision that's going to affect their lives more profoundly than ours. And that was the seed literally on Sanibel of saying, I'm going to have to write something to work it out to explain what's happened, which for me, I'm not an academic, obviously, and I'm not a journalist. I'm kind of an apostate journalist. I'm a storyteller, essentially a short story writer and an essayist. And so for me, it was an, an effort to look at the look at American history through the lens of literature and our political moment, mm -hmm. but much more so to say, rather than doom scrolling and getting lost in the bad outcomes, can we trace out, since we're a storytelling species, that's how we construct meaning and the world around us and the world inside of us. Can I, can I step back and say, what stories authored these bad outcomes? Because unless we rewrite that bad data, we're gonna get the same bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of an effort to, Vivian Gornick would say, sort of step back from the situation and find the story. Um, but it was completely associated in my mind with Sanibel and the, the way in which for many writers, and you're one of them, Jenna, 
2016 was was a deeply tragic but unfortunately necessary inflection point where it's no longer a simple enough to be a citizen of good faith, you have to become, in whatever way it means for you, an activist, an active participant, a subject of history rather than an object of history. And I kind of want you to talk about that since you've been thinking about and writing about um, moments, especially in your first book, where an entire national destiny turns in a very dark direction and how that comes about. Yeah, thank you. I love that you looked at this through an intellectual and literary lens because my first response to any crisis is to do something um, almost physical, I think. I need to process things before I write about them and it often takes me time because I write in fiction, so um, primarily. So I got out in the streets. Like the morning of after the 2016 election, I reserved a hotel room in Washington so I could go to the Women's March, which I then did after I wrote a will. And I went to my first marches and I've been marching ever since. And one of the great things about living in Boston is every time something goes wrong, there's a march on the common like immediately, right? So um, the Muslim ban, people were out that day or at Logan. Um, and so I've been privileged to join the sort of in real life action. And I try to boost it on social media, not to persuade anybody one way or the other, but to sort of hold up a beacon for people who might be feeling afraid and to say, don't worry, we're here. So whatever platform I have, that's why I do it to help people feel less alone, which is what writing is about too, right? You write fiction, you write nonfiction. It's all about feeling less alone and helping other people feel less alone. Uh, but I will say that being a sort of layperson's Holocaust scholar has been a terrifying vantage point on um, what has been happening in our country the last four years. My first novel, Those Who Save Us, was set during the rise of the Nazi regime and then during the Nazi regime. My third novel, The Lost Family, is about the consequences of the Nazi regime two decades later and an ocean away and the ripple effects that it had not only for the participants and the abettors, but also the people who were in the families who had nothing to do with it and were still affected. So the consequences of what we're doing now or not doing will echo for generations. And it's really, really important to me to do whatever I can so I can sleep at night saying, I, I, at least I did this today. I lifted my tiny lamp and you know, hopefully it helped a couple of people. Mm -hmm. um, you have been much more on point than I have in terms of writing to the issues like in bad stories and i'm i'm so fascinated by this because i think the last election was won with stories and lost with stories this election it could not be more visible i had this great conversation with your wife with aaron almond who's also a writer who's up next guys uh, and um this was like very early after the 2016 election and we were both saying isn't it amazing that this war is being fought without a shot fired it's all propaganda it's a pure information war, a writing war. And as writers, we were really fascinated by the narratives on the liberal side, the narratives on the on the conservative side, and beyond those narratives on the Trump side, which are, you know, quite imaginative. I have a household in rural Minnesota, and I'm the only Hillary slash liberal voter there. So I'm surrounded by what those stories are. I know them very well. Um, and I'm amazed that stories have created and now ripped the fabric of this country. So I'm so glad you're writing about this. Can you tell me some of the pushback? Like, do you ever get pushback? Are you ever scared by the pushback you get? Um, I wouldn't say scared. Uh, I would say, in fact, I, I have a, um, whatever they call it, a visual aid, right? So I make <laughs> crazy DIY books and yeah, letters from people who hate me is literally just a compendium of, of hate mail from a time where, uh, from pieces that I would write and the, the, you know, the blowback that you get. But let's be realistic here. You know, there are plenty of people, I'm thinking of journalists, I teach at the Neiman, which is all these journalists who are working all over the, the world. And many of them are really in fear for their lives. They're in regimes that, that where the practice of any kind of journalistic responsibility or reportorial mission puts you in the literal crossfires of the state or extremist groups. So I have not personally, I mean, received plenty of threats, but I have not felt literally imperiled. I'm sure Aaron feels differently about that when people are ideating about, we're gonna track you down, you gut list pieces, us and such. But to me that anybody who's emailing a threat, honestly, or you know, posting a threat online, 
um, they're, they're, I am just a momentary occasion for their outrage. There are literally people paid millions of dollars every year uh, to keep them outraged, to keep them engaged in their own grievance. It's become extraordinarily profitable. And they, these folks are actually borrowing many times, the demagogues and bad political actors are really borrowing from what we think of as a literary set of ideas. What they've managed to do, in other words, Jenna is, and this I'm sure was happening, I know it was happening in Nazi Germany, they've managed to ratchet up the threat level. So if you wanna make a story compelling, you don't just say they're coming um, for your library card. You say they're coming for your guns, they're coming for your God, and they're coming for your granny. And you know that is a, a way that you get people invested in a story is you just quote unquote, raise the stakes. I'm not saying that as praise. I think it's it's fraudulent and it's intended to sow discord and to have people live in their grievances rather than owning their vulnerabilities. It's a set of bad stories, but it's important to understand why those stories are resonating with people instead of just kind of writing off what those stories are. Every story has meaning, whether it's a good story or a bad story. And so I was trying to like the story of Watergate, you know, we we tell ourselves that was a story about a corrupt president, a corrupt person or administration. That was actually a story about a functioning democracy. And, and a functioning democracy is comprised of people's idealism. It's people like you who say, I actually believe that taking action is going to make a difference. So I'm going to get out in the streets and take direct action. One of the things I, I'll, I can speak to these workshops I've been doing, but I don't want you to sleep on how important it is for uh, for Jenna Blum in particular, and for anybody else to actually model what active citizenship looks like. Um, you know, you're a person of some influence, not just to your students, but in general, in the world of readers and writers, for you to have the megaphone means something. And people, I think, need to see their own activism as empowering if they're writers, not and certainly with what they write, but also just in how they model living their lives, saying, okay, maybe a little bit less time on social media and a little bit more time, if not in the streets, volunteering, you know, whatever activism means to you. And furthermore, whatever candidate or cause you support, if you are ardently, I would say anti-choice, but if you were somebody who saw themselves as pro-life, well, then in a democracy, it's your responsibility to advocate for that. And as long as it's an honest advocacy and it's not threatening anyone or spreading falsehoods, go for it. That's what the American experiment's about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, I was at a big event um, talking about both of my books that were set in Nazi Germany and the audience said, uh, what can we do Like, if we ever see something like this happening again? This is before the last election. And, and the other thing that I often heard was that could never happen here, it could never happen in America, which Sinclair Lewis decreed you know, over 70 years ago was not a thing. So it can happen here, it is happening here. But when people said, what can we do about this? I said, that's really for bigger minds than mine to answer. But I think the answer for me is you do everything you can even if it's a small thing, if it's a small act of kindness, if you want to put something that you think is good information on your Facebook page, if you want to call out something that's bad information on your social media, if you want to share stories, if you want to share casseroles, like if you just want to hold hands, you know, I think that's really important. And so for me, I don't ever feel like I'm doing enough, ever. Like I regret that I wasn't at the border when the kids were in the cages and they're still in the cages. Like I think about those people living in Nazi Germany as it was ascending saying, but what can we do? I will just make soup. And sometimes I just make soup and then I feel like crap about it. So I feel as though for each of us every day, you know, it's incumbent upon each of us to decide what is the, the water level that you're comfortable with in terms of your activism, but to try to do something every day if you feel really strongly. Um, we're getting some, some amazing questions. And um, one of them is the, the social media experiment and is social media exacerbating the political climate because people can say whatever they want now without fear of retaliation, except in words online and, um, I personally, like as somebody who runs a social media company and has watched The Social Dilemma, um, find this both fascinating because as a writer, I try to manipulate perception, right? Like I want you to live in your head in a place I've created and feel what my characters are feeling. As a marketer, I want you to read the books I'm promoting because I believe in books. 
Um, and um, I'm aware that social media is a manipulation. Has it been used for ill to fan the flames? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's because people will say things to me online and have said things to me online. They would never say in my living room. They would never say on my porch. My neighbors in Minnesota, like three blocks away, might say something to me online. And then I would see them at the post office and they'd be like, oh, hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. What's the garden doing? And I'm like, you know, you just called me a libtard, right? Like you, you realize that. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel as though it's important to remember that when we're putting our words out there, they have power. Like, what's, yep. what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's so profound. What people need to recognize is that you know the algorithm is is intended to generate money, and it's intended to grab your attention, not your virtue, not your good intentions, not your no. It, it might do that, but it essentially is to make money. And you're, it's a tool that can be used social media for tremendous good to connect with people, to promote things that are important and meaningful in people's lives. Good on all of that. But the essential function and the reason they become sewers of disinformation is their job is to steal your attention. And your job as, as a writer, I think, broadly speaking, is to stop worrying about where the attention of the world is and, and whether the world's paying attention to you and start paying attention to your own life and your inner life and the inner life of your characters. That's really literally your job. So in that sense, I do feel like you have to be careful to not let social media steal too much of your attention because that's their job and they're really good at it. They know how to feed the thing. When I go on doom scrolling, they have learned my habits. They know my inner life because I've revealed my inner life to them. Mm -hmm. And that is really ultimately, if I'm being a responsible artist, the property of my characters. And if I'm writing about my own experience, my own experience. One thing I want to also sort of emphasize, since I know many people listening to this are writers, part of your job um, as a citizen, if you happen to be a storyteller, is to do that work. It is inherently a moral and even a political act to focus your attention in the midst of distraction and to try to get people to imagine, as Jenna was talking about, the experiences of other people, in particular the dispossessed. The problem we have right now is that we're in this echo chamber of the powerful. What, does, what do the rich, powerful white guys have to say to one another? In, in, in our world, completely overlooks all the stories that are about the vast majority of people who are dispossessed in some way or another and disempowered. And so one of the ways Cassidy asked this brilliant question in the comments, thank you for doing that, is like, how do I avoid being didactic and, and sort of putting the, you know, beating the reader, strong arming the reader? And I think it's such a profound question. The answer, at least so far as I've figured out, it is possible to write a social novel Jenna has written a couple of them, right? But what she is doing that by entering into the experience of individuals who find themselves at the mercy of a system that is dehumanizing and is turning them in bad, in bad directions. You cannot enter, you know, you are gonna be essentially creating a kind of moral advertisement unless you can move us into the individual experience of people who are up against systems of power that are corrupt and destructive. Um, that is the only hedge that I've discerned in like my favorite novel of the past uh, uh, you know, year is this novel, The Burning by Mega Majumdar. And it is virtuosic and it's, it's really a novel about Trump's America in the sense that it's about what does the individual do if you are in a corrupt system that incentivizes bad behavior? Uh, and you will be crushed if you attempt to express good and decent behavior or, or any kind of moral outrage at the atrocities around you. We actually, I was going to cite the burning, and uh, a burning, sorry, forgive me, Mega. We had Mega on um, for the Brattleboro Festival last weekend and featured her on The Blaze. This is a debut that everybody should read. And I was also thinking about um, The Vanishing Half, um, which I know a lot of the audience has read. Both of these are fiction. And... Um, I feel as though it was Tom Rockman who said in The Imperfectionists, which is about journalists, who is such a targeted group right now, that social media is the opposite of empathy because every response is blink speed and it's all response and not reaction. It's almost limbic, right? But that fiction and longer form writing is a deep dive into empathy. So whether you're writing narrative nonfiction about your own experience or you're writing fiction and trying to recreate somebody else's experience, it takes time to do that. It takes time to read it. You are literally, as the writer, putting your reader in somebody else's skin and experience. And as the reader, you are 
able to experience somebody else's walking around on this earth in a different skin, in a different gender, in a different body, and how the world interacts with that person. So I think that Steve is totally right that if you are writing, keeping your eyes on the prize in terms of how your character experiences that intersection between his or her own psychology and physical makeup and the circumstances he or she is in um, is the most important thing you can do because you are building across that divide that separates all of us. And social media, I mean, I, I basically just use for, again, lifting up that beacon as opposed to trying to be didactic. I think humor leavens a lot of this as well, like as passionate as we can be about everything. You're never going to get anywhere by just yelling in people's faces all the time. So, you know, I do a lot of posts of my dog, who is now has a different toy. Um, and you know, let's just say, like, we're all human. Like, we all have these vulnerabilities and these sillinesses and these flaws and frailties in our lives. And we can still do amazing things coming together. We can still say, this is wrong. This is an outrage. We need to stop this. Let's do what we can. L let's throw up. Ezra had an, a, an amazing question. So I want to throw that one up. Uh, and as we find it, I want to say just a quick thing, which is, you're, Jenna, when you're talking, it put me in mind of also of this memoir, Memorial Drive, the Natasha Trethaway book. And part of what she's, it's such a remarkable story. It's really, it's a lot, it's, a, it's about a lot of things like a good memoir is, but it's, it's partly about how, how abuse functions and what it's like to live under the shadow of an abuser, which everybody to some extent or another, if you're conscious right now, knows what that feels like. Mm -hmm. But what's so brilliant about that memoir and what your job, if you're a nonfiction writer out there, your job is to recollect the experience and then from Longfellow says, you know, a posture of tranquility to try to write about turmoil. So to draw back from the, the recollections, the experiences, and try to pluck out the meaning of what did those events mean. And that's what, always what a good memoir does. And it's why they're so gratifying to read because we have, we're in a, in a sense reacting like we do on social media, a squirt of rage, you know, a, a dab of, of sorrow, but we're not always drawing back and trying to understand why did this moment, why did this event affect me so deeply? What was my role in it? Um, what's my moral responsibility in it? And that is what good writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is always doing. It's trying to reflect on what experience means. Um, but if you'll throw up, uh, guys, if you'll throw up Ezra's question, I think Jen and I would love to, to answer that one because it was really smart. Right. Uh, they asked, how do you find a balance between your emotional well-being and your activism? I really want to do more, but I find myself very affected by conflict, especially as a person in a marginalized group. And I'll just say a quick thing, Jenna, which is there is a, a, a term for this coined by the poet Wallace Stevens. He talked about and he wrote this essay some years ago uh, after World War II. Uh, called the, no the the sound the noble rider in the sound and in it he talks about what he calls the pressure of the real Ezra mm -hmm. and the pressure of the real is that unending drumbeat of bad stories that essentially makes you feel that your imagination is pointless um, and and makes you feel hopeless and isolated and part of the reason that Jen and I were excited to do this panel is because we live under that pressure and we have, we're have we sort of frantically always trying to figure out what we can do to throw off the pressure of the real. Because if you don't and you surrender uh, to, to, to apathy and also to sort of turning away from your writing because it feels pointless, you, you've essentially given up, I think, to, to, to a bad enemy because the pressure of the real is calculated, all that propaganda is calculated to make you feel hopeless and isolated and to shut down both the attention that you give to your work and your characters, but also to your moral responsibility in this world. Mm -hmm. There really isn't anything I can say that is smarter than that, Steve, so thank you for that. I think my agent who I was talking to the other day said that she felt we were all walking around with a really heavy flak jacket on all the time right now, that we bear the weight not only of the pandemic, but the political uncertainty in this country. No matter what side you're on, nobody is happy right now. Nobody is happy. Everybody is scared. If you look at um, the more conservative threads, they're terrified of liberals. They're scared of me. I'm like, you guys are scared of me. Do you see who this person is? Like, I could, you know, throw a drink in your face. That's about it. So don't worry about it. But, you know, really, I could vote you out. Like, ooh. Um, but everybody is scared. Everybody is fearful. And I think each person really has to, again, um, as a find your own 
comfort level with what it is you can do and then maybe do it. Because again, for me, action helps negate fear, helps negate anger. Um, I love Steve's term, the squirt of anger. Like I have many squirts of anger, mostly after midnight when I am squirt tweeting at Trump. Um, but that helps me. And then I think, well, that was also like sort of useless except to amuse myself. And so therefore, like, what am I going to do tomorrow to sort of raise the lantern? And I know, Steve, you're doing some very concrete things um, to help raise a lantern and to help raise money um, and, to, and to get yourself out there. I just I want to do a quick um, a quick dive into the deep dive since this question is such a good one from mm -hmm. And thank you all for your amazing questions. Yeah. Um, the deep dive into empathy, for me, that means when I write long form fiction or long form nonfiction narrative, which is not my specialty, but which I have just um, finished a book doing, it means that I'm spending time inside another person's skin. And whether that person is a Holocaust survivor who happens to be male and we're meeting him in 1965 and trying to understand backwards what his experience is, or in the case of like a memoir that I just finished, my own skin, you know, years ago, and like trying to figure out like who was I then and what experiences influenced the way I live now and the decisions I make now, spending the time to write about those things, spending the time to read about those things is the opposite of what we see on social media, where everything literally, I mean, Twitter is like a swift moving river, right? So, um, just taking the time to understand other people and to try and extend that imaginative empathy into not only where they come from, but you come from is an act of compassion. And I think it really is the only way through, even though, yes, I want to kill people who are on the other side from me. Like I, I would like everybody to bend to my will. That would be nice. It's never going to happen. <laughs> so we have to figure out where are you coming from? What are the stories you're telling yourself? As Steve said, like, what are the good stories? What are the bad stories? What are our stories of commonality? That is something that we don't have a chance to figure out in this administration. But if this onus is removed from us, we may be able to find a, a common story again. Yeah. That is my fervent hope. Yeah, to, to put it in the active voice, if we remove, right? Uh, you know, even, even like um, politics and English language, the, the Orwell essay is saying, you know, our language isn't a coincidence, it's a reflection. So I think there's this. I, I certainly fall into a pattern of saying, well, are the millennials going to show up? Uh, you know, is the media going to shape up? Da, da, who's going to save us? And, uh, the, you know, we, we are actually going to save us in each of our constituent behaviors. And for somebody even like Ezra is saying, well, as a marginalized person, part of how you um, the role that you play in this as a, as a writer, citizen, citizen of good faith is simply speaking about your experience so that people cannot so easily ignore it or dismiss it or caricature it. Um, th that is part of, uh, um, it's not a responsibility, but it's an opportunity. If you are part of a marginalized group, it doesn't mean you have to, but one thing you, sh you can do, and this is why I think that, you know, the movements that are about breaking silences, the kind of omertas that are enforced by patriarchal dominion or whatever it is, uh, are so necessary is because, there is a silence and erasure that we have to overwrite. And it's individuals who do that. So if you're part of a marginalized group, it's important to think about the story that you were born into and making other people aware of it. The reason I do my workshops for democracy is the same reason that Jenna picks up her megaphone. It's what she's good at. She's a tumbler. She is given to it. That is her nature. It's what brings her, if not joy, a sense of being able to reclaim her life. And that's like nobody like I could try to do lots of things. The best use of my limited time and, and um, you know, uh, skill set is that people will take workshops with me. So I figured out, OK, how can I leverage this? And part of what's nice about doing a workshop for democracy is the same reason it's nice to be in this space with all of you. It's communal. And we move from the individual doom scrolling on our screens with our you know reactions to oh, we're kind of in a big boat and the seas are rough and people are getting frightened and, and sick, but we're not alone in it. Uh, and, you know, if enough people hold up a lantern, you know, we'll find our way. It's very important to be in a group with other people. And that's part of what these workshops for democracy, it's just a writing, a set of writing classes. But what happens before is we just spend the first five or 10 minutes literally talking about who, who we contributed to, 
what, we're, what our action plan is, the ways in which we're going to use our time and money and attention to try to bring about a world that we can feel better about and less frightened and uh, upset about and more hopeful about. And that act alone is like supercharges everybody. Everybody leaves feeling like, oh, okay, this is not hopeless. This is just going to take us citizens of good faith, taking action in the ways that um, we're best suited to. We don't have to do everything. I like what you said, Jenny, you just do one thing. Anything you can. I love what you said too about the sense of community, Steve, because that's what I got from the marches. I mean, I'm somebody who tends to be like surprisingly fairly socially phobic unless I'm controlling the situation. So to go to the, the women's march, like it was like terrifying. And also there was a lot of propaganda about that, about how people are gonna like ride through the crowd on motorcycles and kill people and this, that, the other. But that march and every march that I have been to since. I was so moved literally to tears because I'm a sap that way. But like every time I go to a march, I cry. Every time I vote, I cry. But just to see people engaged in the American experience and the, and the experiment of it and the belief in that, like people making signs on cardboard and holding them up saying, this situation is so bad, even the introverts are here. I thought, yes. Yeah. Like, and so I left feeling really energized about my country in a way that I had not ever before. And I had a dad who was a journalist who wrote for Cronkite, who covered Watergate, who covered Vietnam. Right? And I should have, I've been interested in politics forever, but I never had the sense of community outside or writing community until I started going to the marches and becoming politically active. So I feel as though like that plus my writing community, which in many ways is an overlap, has been a very nourishing experience in the midst of a lot of the difficult experiences that Ezra and so many of you in the chat are alluding to. It's a really, really tough time. Hold hands, write stories. Um, there's a great question of Vimor 21999, whose name I don't actually know, so I'm just going to call you that, Vimor. Um, but the tips for in avoiding imposter syndrome, I can just sort of like segue into that. Um, because in terms of like holding hands and writing about your experiences, I think avoiding imposter syndrome for me is easiest when I'm writing from emotion. Um, and my emotion, my reaction to the election has mostly been rage an outrage that the country that I love and feel like I love the country as much as my family. I love the country as much as my friends, as much as my ass puppy over here. Um, and as much as myself and without country, you have nothing. So um, I feel as though my outrage about the way the country has been hijacked by these narratives um, and by fake information um, and journalists have been attacked and so on, has been channeled into my writing, both fiction and nonfiction. And I don't feel as though I have imposter syndrome because that is purely my reaction. And then if I'm writing fiction, I will ventriloquize it into characters and their experiences. And if I'm writing nonfiction, then it's just a matter of me trying to find some elegant way to say it. So it's not just all F-bombs, right? So that's my answer. Steve, what do you, do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, one question you can ask be more and everybody else since i think imposter syndrome is just endemic especially if you're trying to do something as audacious and and sort of culturally niche as writing stories or you know writing literature at all so everybody's walking around with imposter syndrome but one thing that is helpful to step back and realize is that i think marginalized groups and women in particular are conditioned to feel that their voices matter less and that their stories matter less. This is, you gotta step outside the frame and say, who exactly is served by my silence? Who is served by, what forces are trying to make me feel that I do not have the right to be precise about my own experiences? That's the way MFK Fisher talks about it, the wonderful writer and food critic. She says, I liked writing because it granted me permission to be precise about my own experiences. So one question to ask, be more, is who is served by my silence and where did I get the idea? And I don't just mean from a, a you know childhood or se a family dynamics, although that's probably a part of it, but even outside of that, what, what have I encountered? What stories is the culture trying to tell me that lead me to believe that my experience is somehow fake or unworthy of being heard, or that if I speak, try to speak truthfully, it's inevitably gonna be false. 
I also, when you were saying who is who is served by the silence, I was like, ooh, ooh, I know the answer. Ooh, I know the answer. Because um, to drop the Elie Wiesel bomb into the conversation, Dr. Wiesel, who I had the great, great privilege of studying with at, at Boston University when I was doing my graduate degree, um, it was the only time in my life I was ever silent because I was so awed by him. I could not really say anything, um, ironically. But he said silence always helps the oppressor never the oppressed. And we must not be neutral. We must take sides. And I think about that every day. I thought about it in 2016 when people said, Jenna, you have a platform. Why are you using your power for ill to divide people? And I said, that is something that is a, a line that you're repeating from Fox. Right? But I see a wrong. I need to call out the wrong. That is my responsibility. That is what I do. My dog also does not want to be silent. He's like, I am oppressed under the table with my right. toy. <laughs> Oh my God, you guys, I'm so sorry. These are such great questions. I love them. Steve, can you um, talk a little bit about your about your next democracy workshop? Because I know a lot of people probably want to. Yeah, we can throw up the, um, the, the the link to it. It's just one on the comic impulse. It'll be on Monday night in, in uh, you know, you have to, it's on my website so people can find that, stevealmondjoy.org. Um, but the, the central thing I wanted to just say quickly, I was thinking a lot about a burning and, and, um, as we were preparing to have this talk, Jenna, and you talked about what you were talking about, um, just really spurred that idea of who's who's being served ultimately. So this novel enters a world at, at a historical moment when citizens like all across the globe, but especially in this in the United States, have surrendered their capacity to imagine the suffering of others. That's what's going on. And this moral lassitude is the the greatest subsidy it's the greatest gift that you could give to the rich and powerful mm. to the morally demented who who profit by incitement and and, and this silence has really fortified uh, the legal and economic structures that ex that by design are exploiting immigrants uh and and refugees and the disempowered and oftentimes reducing them to to the status of vermin mm. literature is a part of this struggle what what Jivan, the hero of that or heroine of that novel, says is uh, or said about her: if she had received a chance to tell her story, how might her life have been? If she had received a chance to tell her story, how might her life have been? And it's like this question that echoes for all of us, and it echoes within us, saying, "Is there a story that I should be telling and and allowing myself to tell?" And also, where should my attention be going? Maybe telling stories of the powerful and wealthy and their grievances and accusations is not actually the best use of, of, of this precious attention that I have as an artist. Mm -hmm. I think we probably have time for maybe one more question. I saw in the chat that um, people have been putting up uh, links to your event with Cheryl Strayed as well. Yeah. Dear Sugar Reunion on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern, right? Which I would love to come to, except I'm teaching, so hopefully it will be recorded. Um, but can you tell us a tiny bit about that? It's just going to be a reunion. I mean, it took literally the most morally consequential election of our lifetimes to get Cheryl Strayed back in a room with me, but it happened. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's just going to be it's just going to be us in discussion, and part of the reason that that place was so powerful for for us was that it was people telling the truth about their own experiences. And that ultimately as a writer, whether you sort of disguise it fictionally or not, is what you're doing. You're always trying to tell the truth about your own experiences, even if it's in fictive disguise. So we're just super excited to just be in that space again. Yeah, I had the great, great privilege of talking with Cheryl on the Blaze, and it was she lives in Portland, and it was when the Portland riots who were first in the news and going really strong, and we were talking about how important it is to keep holding up your megaphone, whether literally or figuratively. And I just wanted to encourage those of you who are in the chat who are like, this is all great, you guys, but you guys are writers who are already published. And so how do we how do we do anything? How do we affect anything? Uh, and I, I want to encourage you, like there are many ways of making your voice hurt. Like you can go to a march with a megaphone. You can go with a sign that you write on the back of an air conditioner cardboard box. Right. You can go online with it. Um, whatever platform you have that helps you exercise right. your voice and your passion and to again hold up your beacon and say i'm out here too we're all out here so that right. we can all do this together i encourage you to do that and to not feel helpless and to not feel alone because your voice whatever channel you put it in is the most powerful weapon 
you have. So I'm so appreciative that you're here at a conference of writers where we're all using our voice. Steve, I could talk to you about this for like literally a week straight. Maybe we should we would be like the time. last two people left. It would be like a dance Perfect. marathon where everybody's like, okay, we kind of get it, guys. Right. We'd be like, but also you could write postcards and you should just do whatever you can do. Right. right. And like, there's a you know parachute jump that we can do. That would be great. So yes, thank you so much for this. I actually feel very energized by it. And I hope everybody else does too. Me too. Me too. Thank you. All right, you guys, take care. Enjoy. I'll be on again in like a few minutes with Tom DeMarkey and Aaron Almond talking about debut fiction. Gonna We're the just the opening act. We've just been ramping up. We're just warming everybody up. So you guys go get some more coffee. You know, I'm going to put my dog in a well in the basement and um, I'll see you. <laughs> take care, guys. Stay active. <laughs>